Well, we are going to begin this morning with a little bit of show and tell. Our words of integration and guidance this morning, which Graham read for us, come from this book, which was written by Bishop John Shelby Spog. He's one of the leading biblical scholars in the world today. And the name of the book is called Biblical Literalism. And in the book, Bishop Spong reminds us the Bible was not written as a literal history. It was not meant to be understood that way. And Bishop Spong says to read the Bible that way is actually harmful and dangerous. Bishop Spong says in this book that the Bible is not the Word of God. It's not words that came out of God's mouth. God didn't author the Bible. The Bible, he says, is a human product. And what it tells us is more about the way our religious ancestors saw things than the way God sees things. And in this book, he gives us example after example after example of how the Bible has been used to cause harm and to divide people over the centuries. The Bible has been used to justify slavery. The Bible has been used to subjugate women. The Bible has been used to denounce interracial couples and gay people. The Bible has been used to divide people into categories as either clean or unclean, chosen or unchosen, saved or unsaved. The Bible has been used to divide us, but Jesus came to tell us we are one. So in today's gospel reading, as we just heard, Jesus himself is reading from Scripture, from what we now call the Old Testament. He returns home to his boyhood synagogue, he unrolls the scroll of Scripture, and he reads those words of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of God is upon me. God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and to set the oppressed free. Jesus is saying, I came here for the poor and for the oppressed. Now, these words sound very similar to his mother's words. If you were here a few weeks ago, we were talking about Mary's Magnificat. And if you remember, her Magnificat said the same thing. She said, God has looked with favor upon me. The lowly will be lifted up high, and the mighty will be thrown down from their thrones. Now, these words have been considered very dangerous, even though to us they may seem very mild. But you know, Mary's Magnificat, it was actually banned throughout history by many governments. During the British rule of India, it was forbidden to read aloud or to sing Mary's Magnificat in public. And just as recently as the 1980s, the government of Guatemala banned it from being read aloud. We sometimes forget how revolutionary and radical the gospel is. So Jesus' words here are just as radical. And when he says after reading, the scripture has been fulfilled today in your hearing, that was a threat. It was a threat to the religious and political authorities. Because what Jesus was doing is he was saying this new social order where the rich and powerful are going to be thrown down from their thrones and the lowly and oppressed are going to be lifted up high, it begins today and it begins with you. So you can see why they wanted to arrest Jesus and to silence him. Jesus was challenging the status quo. What he was doing is he was challenging the religious and political structures of his day. Religion and society in Jesus' day said that certain people, people like sick people, poor people, women, people of other uh, religions, foreigners, and, and a whole range of other people, they were considered unworthy because they were following the purity codes from Scripture, which said that these people were unclean, 
that these people were unsaved, that these people weren't worthy. They were outsiders. Jesus today is proclaiming in that synagogue, no, you have it all wrong. That actually, the people who you consider outsiders are actually now insiders. And the people that you consider unclean, well, they're clean. Jesus was saying, you are all one. That was his central message. Everyone's equal. Everybody's one. You're all God's children. In Galatians 3, it says, you are all children of God. There is no more male or female. There is no more slave or free. There is no more Jew or Greek. You are all one. And in John 17, Jesus said those words that are on our UCC logo, that they may all be one. That was Jesus' hope and prayer for us, that we would all be one. It was about oneness. But I want to be clear. Oneness doesn't mean sameness. Sameness isn't the point. We're all different, but we're all one. And that's that beautiful thing that Paul was trying to say to the Corinthians this morning, which Graham read for us. He gave that beautiful example of the human body, how there are many parts to the body. They're all different, but they're all valuable. They're all of worth. They're all necessary and needed. If one part suffers, the, the whole suffers. We're all one, and we should celebrate our differences. Unfortunately, as you know, there are many Christians in our country today who don't celebrate those differences. Our country's motto, e pluribus unum, means out of many, one. Same thing Jesus was trying to say, and it's the beautiful thing about our country, is that we're all different, but we're all one. But so many Christians today, they're kind of trying to drag us back to those purity codes of old. If you don't believe me, just turn on the news. Just this week, we heard that transgender people will be banned from serving in the military for no good reason other than that they're transgender. And this week on the news, we heard that the second lady of the United States is working at a school that bans gay students, gay teachers, and gay parents for no other reason other than that they're gay. And on the news this week, we heard about a host of Michigan adoption agencies who refuse to allow LGBT couples to adopt children in our state. So think about it. If you ban transgender people from serving in the military, if you ban gay people from schools, if you ban lesbian couples from adopting, if you support bans on Muslims and bans on refugees, you're the one doing the dividing. But here's what happens. It gets flipped around on us. When we speak out against this discrimination, when we take to the streets and protest, they call us the dividers. They say that we're spreading hate. Well, guess what? We're in really good company, because that's what they said about Jesus. Okay? Jesus was called a divider. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus turns to the crowds and he said, Who made me a divider? I am not a divider. Jesus was trying to spread this message of oneness and inclusion, but the religious and political authorities of his day said he was dividing people. And that is not Jesus' agenda. Jesus' agenda was love and oneness. And my friends, that is not a liberal agenda. It's a Christian agenda. Just this week, Sojourners, which is a Christian magazine, had an article entitled, Social Justice is a Christian Tradition, Not a Liberal Agenda. And in that article, it said, 
Throughout the New Testament, Jesus intentionally, purposefully, and passionately addressed very specific causes. He radically addressed the diverse and complicated conflicts of his time, and he shattered the status quo. Jesus wasn't just preaching a universal message of love for the world. He was also addressing specific political, social, and radical issues. He was helping those who were being abused, violated, and oppressed. Participating in social justice is a Christian tradition inspired by Jesus. By addressing racism, immigration, gender equality, and a litany of other issues, you are following in the steps of Jesus. So if we're Christians, if we're truly following in the steps of Jesus, then we are called to welcome the foreigner and the stranger. We are called to celebrate the marginalized and the oppressed. And why? Because that's what Christianity is all about. It's about oneness. Jesus said, I am in the Father, you are in me, I am in you, we are all one. Meaning God's DNA is in every single person, regardless of your gender identity, sexual orientation, race, religion, country of origin, God's DNA is in you. Meaning that we are all God's children, we are all one family, and it's why Jesus urged us to love one another. Our friend John Pavlovitz, who spoke here in November, said, If someone's race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, or country of origin is keeping you from loving them fully, then you're doing love wrong. And just this week, he said, At the end of your time here, you will either have been a table builder or a wall builder. Which are you? Pope Francis said something very similar just this week. Pope Francis was speaking to tens of thousands of young people in Panama City, and this is what he said. A person who thinks only about building walls, wherever they may be, and not building bridges, is not a Christian. This is not the gospel. People think that if we marginalize, separate, and isolate others, all of our problems will be magically solved. We must create dialogue to help overcome fears and suspicions that live in the imaginations of people. Builders of walls sow fear and divide people. Be builders of bridges and not builders of walls. Those are the words of Pope Francis. Is Pope Francis uh, a liberal snowflake who's trying to divide people? Okay. He's speaking truth. He's speaking truth. A Course in Miracles says there are just two emotions, love and fear. One is from God and one isn't. It is fear, fear of the other, that divides. It is love that unites. And so that's what we are being called as Christians to do, is we're being called to love one another, to see the oneness in one another, and to find common ground. But I'm going to be honest with you. Yes, I am a pastor, but I am also human. And I find it very hard to find common ground with Christians, for example, who are in the KKK, which, by the way, is defined as a Christian organization. I find it difficult to find common ground with them. And I find it difficult to find common ground with another Christian organization, the Westboro Baptist Church, who holds up signs at funerals that say, God hates fags. I find it hard finding common ground with them. And I find it hard finding common ground with the white Christian young men who walk around with tiki torches and flash the white power sign. 
I know Jesus is calling me to find common ground with them, but I'm having difficulty doing that. James Baldwin, the writer who was both black and gay, said, We can disagree and still love one another unless your disagreement is with my oppression and the denial of my humanity and my right to exist. So it is difficult for me to find common ground with people who are denying my humanity and my right to exist. But I know that as a Christian, as a follower of the way of Jesus, I am being called to love. And that's why Jesus said over and over again, he really wanted us to get it. He said, love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek and forgive them 70 times seven times. And it's why Martin Luther King Jr., a true Christian minister, said, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. That's what we're called to do. And I know we're living in a time of great division, and I know it's hard to find common ground. But in the spirit of oneness to which Jesus calls us, let us always be people of love. We can use that power of love like Jesus did to speak truth to power and to transform people's hearts and minds. Let us do that as we continue to build the beloved community together and to bring about the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Now, I'm going to conclude this morning with a letter that was written by our UCC president, Reverend John Dorhauer, this week and which we were asked to read from the pulpit this morning. Dear partners in Christ, the vision of a body united in purpose, in mission, in vision, is one that inspired the birth of our denomination. All of our spiritual impulses reverberate in an effort to call us into a more perfect union, Throughout our shared history as a people of faith and as a part of the body of Christ, we have challenged ourselves to widen the circle of inclusion. Widening the circle has always come with growth pains as we shed old skins and welcome those whom we had previously thought unwelcome. And with each new articulation, of a more fully expressed body of Christ, we have realized new joy. Through it all, we remain focused on the call to be one and committed to meeting the challenges inherent in that call. We are now living in and through a season when the threats to unity are legion. Talks of walls that mark refugees as threats Labels like terrorists that attach too easily to Muslims, overt racial bias that normalizes fear and hatred, a pandemic of abuse to women with the trigger reflex to forgive the men who author that abuse have turned America into a land many of us no longer recognize and that too many of us are finding harder and harder to reconcile with our faith. Now more than ever, the Holy Spirit of the living God and the risen Christ is seeking to partner with anyone who's committed to unifying the human community. The gospel mandate to love our neighbor as we love ourselves resonates deep within us. It calls for the better angels among us and within us to always resist impulses to hate to condemn, to vilify, or to castigate. In such a time as this, the United Church of Christ's call is to fulfill the prayer of Jesus that they may all be one. It stands as an urgent mandate to disciples who envision a just world for all. United with you in God's service, the Reverend John Dorhauer, General Minister and President. Namaste.
We are so